Hello, let me be one of the first to wish you a wonderful Independence Day. Here in the USA, we celebrate the 4th of July in a variety of ways. And why not? Our freedoms are both unique and special. In many countries, people look to the government to tell them what they can, have, and do. But not in America. Here the government is of, by, and for the people. Even if occasionally we people must occasionally remind them of that fact of our independence. And my fellow citizens are an amazing group of people. We know hardship and prosperity, difficulty and sacrifice. Yet perhaps greatest of all is a sense of sacrifice to keep our freedom and that freedom of others as well. Many Americans have literally risked their lives and many have also given their lives so that others could live free. I am grateful for those who have served our country and especially to those who are serving in uniform this very day. And often our greatest unsung heroes are forgotten, those incredible families who sacrifice, sometimes going all the holidays without their loved one who's in uniform with them. And some of them go overseas and serve as well along with that loved one. But the sacrifices are amazing. And we are oblivious all too often to that fact. However, today I want to share with you an example of another kind of soldier. One that frankly does not immediately come to mind for most people. And as I do this, I want to share with you an event from our past. And in doing so, I want to tell you about four special men. Special because of their patriotism and courage. And special because there are still such people today for which I praise God. Let me introduce you to Lieutenant George Fox, Lieutenant Alexander George, Lieutenant John Washington, and Lieutenant Clark Poling. Now, they were all relatively new, all held the rank of first lieutenant. Oh, and one other thing that I might not have mentioned, they were all relatively new chaplains. The Reverend George L. Fox, born March 15, 1900, in Lewistown, Pennsylvania. At 17, he joined the Army and served in World War I. He was highly decorated for bravery and was awarded the Silver Star, the Purple Heart, and the French Croix de Guerre. After the war, he returned home and finished school, got married, became a Methodist minister. As World War II came on, he volunteered to serve as an army chaplain, July 24, 1942. Oh, and there was Alexander David Good, uh, who got his PhD. He was born in Brooklyn, New York on May 10, 1911. He originally applied to become a Navy chaplain in January of 1941 but was not accepted. After the attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941, he applied to the Army. He received his appointment as a chaplain on July 21st, 1942. The Reverend Clark V. Poling. Clark Poling was born August 7th, 1910 in Columbus, Ohio, the son of an evangelical minister, Daniel A. Poling. He was ordained in the Reformed Church in America. With the outbreak of World War II, Poling decided to enter the army, wanting to face the same danger as others would be facing. His father, who had served as a World War I chaplain, told him that chaplains risk and do give their lives as well. With that knowledge, he applied to serve as an army chaplain, accepting an appointment on June 10, 1942. And finally, John Patrick Washington. John P. Washington was born in Newark, New Jersey on July 18, 1908. He graduated in 1931 with an A.B. degree and entering the Immaculate Conception Seminary in Darlington, New Jersey shortly after the Pearl Harbor attack of December 7, 1941, Father Washington received his appointment as a chaplain in the United States Army. On February 3, 1943, the U.S. Army Transport Dorchester was one of three ships in a convoy that was moving across the Atlantic from Newfoundland to an American base in Greenland. A converted luxury liner, the Dorchester was crowded to capacity, carrying 902 servicemen, merchant seamen, and civilian workers. 
It was only about 150 miles from its destination when shortly after midnight, an officer on board the German submarine U-2 spotted it. After identifying and targeting the ship, he gave orders to fire. The hit was decisive, striking the ship far below the waterline. The initial blast killed scores of men and seriously wounded many, many more. Amazing time, to say the least. Others stunned by the explosion were groping in the darkness. Panic and chaos quickly set in. Men were screaming, others were crying, or frantically trying just to get to lifeboats and get off the ship. Through the pandemonium, four men spread out among the soldiers, calming the frightened, tending the wounded, and guiding the disoriented to a place of safety. They were four army chaplains. Lieutenant George Fox, a Methodist. Lieutenant Alexander Good, a Jewish rabbi. Lieutenant John Washington, a Roman Catholic priest. And Lieutenant Clark Poling, a Dutch Reformed minister. Quickly and quietly. The four chaplains worked to bring calm back to the men, to get them focused, to getting to a point of safety. As soldiers began to find their way to the deck of the ship, many were still in their underclothes, having been sleeping, and when they were confronted by the cold winds blowing down from the Arctic blast, can you imagine? Petty Officer John J. Mahoney, reeling from the cold, headed back towards his cabin, and a voice in the darkness said, Where are you going? To get my gloves, Mahoney replied. Here, take these said Rabbi Good as he handed a pair of gloves to the young officer. He said, I can't take those gloves, Mahoney replied. Never mind, the rabbi replied. I have two pairs. It's, it was only long after that that Mahoney realized the chaplain never intended to leave the ship. Once topside, the, the chaplains opened a storage locker and began distributing life jackets. It was then that engineer Grady Clark witnessed an astonishing sight. When there were no more laugh jackets in the storage room, there none available, the chaplains simultaneously, without saying a word, removed their own, and they gave them to four frightened young men. One survivor would later make the comment, it was the finest thing that I've ever seen or ever hoped to see this side of heaven. As the ship went down, survivors in nearby rafts could see the four chaplains up there, arms linked and braced against the slanting deck. Their voices could also be heard, offering up prayers and singing hymns. Of the 902 men aboard the U.S. Transport Dorchester, only 230 survived of that 902. Before boarding the Dorchester back in January, Chaplain Poling had asked his father to pray for him. And basically the gist of his prayer was this, that not for my safe return. Now, that just wouldn't be fair. He said, just pray that I will do my duty and never be a coward and have the strength, courage, and understanding of the men. Just pray that I shall be adequate. That's all he asked. Although the Distinguished Service Cross and Purple Heart were later awarded posthumously to these four incredible men, Congress wished to confer the Medal of Honor, but was blocked by the stringent requirements which required heroism performed under fire, and you may recall that they were doing much of what they did after the attack, after the submarine strike. As the ship was going down, not under fire, but death, waiting in the wings in the cold, cold waters of the ocean. That's when they gave their service. Heroism under fire, but nonetheless heroism. So a posthumous special medal for heroism, which came to be known as the Four Chaplains Medal, was authorized by Congress and awarded by President Eisenhower on January 18, 1961, it was never given before and will never be given again. When I was growing up in elementary school in a town known as Bladensburg, Maryland, we had a class trip that we made to a wax museum there in the Washington, D.C. area. 
In one section, I came into this room. It was massive, this incredible display to the four chaplains. I still remember walking into this darkly lit room. There were some sound effects going, and almost one entire wall looked like the side of a ship. And it was there on display, and as you look down the, to the base of the display, it was actually sitting in water that was lapping on the side as though it was there in the ocean to give you the full impact. What clearly looked like a military ship, and on the side of that ship as I looked up were four wax figures looking out into the distance and the darkness, as if they were looking for something. Even now I can only imagine what was on the minds of the people that these wax figures were representing, those four chaplains. But it stirred my young imagination greatly. At that time, it stirred me to research and to question as time went by, who were these men? What had they done? And over the years, I have been blessed to know men and women much like them, people that you and I, we call them patriots. Ordinary men and women who do extraordinary things. People who, by God's grace, help to keep you and me free. If you hadn't thought of it before, you're living the life of an independent, a free citizen. Because others have literally given everything of themselves. You see, that is the cost of freedom. Everything. And to be free, to have our loved ones free, well, to a patriot, that's a bargain price. So on this Independence Day, remember the four chaplains who freely gave everything. And remember generations of patriots, brave men and women who have literally given everything. And today, as you celebrate, Remember around the globe, patriots, their families, well, they're still paying our price, yours and mine. God bless you. Live free and know that through Christ you can succeed. God bless you.